We made a deal to each other that first day that no matter what happened, we wouldn't eat each other. Because Robin, of course, was not a family member. And we assured him that we would die together. He thought you might eat him? He thought we might eat him. Hello and welcome to another episode of Extraordinary Lives, the podcast from Lad Bible. I'm joined today by Douglas Robertson. Uh, Douglas, could you give a brief introduction to yourself? Yeah, well, uh, my name's Douglas Robertson and I was cast adrift in the Pacific for 38 days. I'm aware of your story. It's an amazing one and I'm excited to hear all about it. I suppose the first thing we'll do is give a little bit of context of who you were before this happened. What was your life like at this point and what, what age were you and, and, and which family members were you with when you decided to plan this trip? Yeah, well, we were farmers from the middle of England in Staffordshire and we were hill farmers, basically. Uh, it's a very hard way to make a living uh, in the uh, Pennines and... Um, I don't think the farm was particularly successful. Mm. I was the eldest son. And um, they, I think my dad was at his uh, w end of his tether economically. And he was a sea captain, former sea captain. And um, my mum was a nurse in Hong Kong. They worked, both worked in Hong Kong. Mm. And they came back to England and being eminently qualified in other areas, decided to take up farming, which they had no qualifications for at all, you know. <laughs> interesting and, choice. Uh, yes, interesting choice, you know. Robin Knox Johnson had just won the round the world race. Okay. And it, sailing around the world in those days was a very adventurous thing to do because navigation was all by sextant, uh, compasses were all magnetic compasses, mm -hmm and uh, seagoing life was primitive. So to do it in a small yacht, uh, relying on sail alone, there were a, there were a few well-known names of the time, uh, Sir Francis Chichester and Alec Rose, and they'd done circumnavigations. But Sir Robin Knox Johnson was um, a master mariner like my dad. So my dad had qualified as a sea captain, and uh, Robin Knox Johnson was the same. He'd won this race, and my brother Neil said, Dad, if Robin Knox Johnson can sail around the world, why can't we sail around the world? In fact, his exact words were, Daddy's a sailor, why don't we sail around the world? Now, you know, kids can be responsible for some very devastating uh, outcomes. You know, they, that got Dougal thinking. Dougal's your father. Dougal's my dad, yeah. He, he made this decision to sell the farm and buy a boat and sail around the world. But just, just, uh, just to go into that a bit, it, it, it you said that the farm, you were, the, the financially, it was struggling. It was struggling, yeah. Very sort of like closed off rural upbringing. Yeah. And that feels a bit, you know, what was the plan after that? If you'd sold uh, the farm and I don't know. Uh, and how long would was, was a proposed trip around the world to take? Well, you know, you pick a number out of the air, don't you? But four years was picked out of the air. Wow. Yeah. So we we thought we would give up four years to do this trip. I said, it's, that's what we decided. Wow. And that's what we wanted too. We, as kids, we wanted that. So when you say as kids, can you just give me a snapshot of the family? Who was planning to go on this trip? Well, first of all, there was my mum and dad who yeah. both come from, my dad was a former sea yeah. captain, so he comes from a sailing background. They lived in Hong Kong, so they went yachting a lot, mm -hmm. sailing a yacht a lot there. So my mum was a, a nurse there and... Uh, so she'd been sailing and they'd met sailing. They met when they were actually sailing at a, at a yacht club in Aberdeen Harbour in Hong Kong. Uh, the, there was my elder sister. She was, um, let's get the ages right, 18. Okay. Just finished her A-levels. And what was her name? Anne. Anne, okay. Yeah. And she was, uh, then there was me, uh, the eldest son. Mm -hmm. So I'd just finished my O-levels. Neil and Sandy were twins. They... they, they um, they were aged uh, 11, 12, mm -hmm. that, and they'd just finished their 11 plus. So they were the youngsters, mm -hmm. and maybe a bit more idealistic than 
than the rest of us because they could say things without consequences. But yes, at so, 11 years old. Yeah, at 11 years old, my daddy's a sailor, why don't we sail yeah. around the world? Nobody ever thought that Dougal was actually going to consider it for a minute or two, you know. And then suddenly he said, why not? We'd all reached significant milestones in our education, mm. so therefore we could take some time off to sail around the world. But of course it was Dougal who really wanted to sail around the world because when, when I look back at it, he was escaping he was escaping the uh, financial outcome of the farm. It hadn't worked. How do you actually go about choosing a boat or buying a boat? That's a good question. Mm. Um, the, the, we didn't have a lot of money, so we, it was getting a big yacht was out of the question. But we did have a farm. The farm we sold for £8,250. Wow. But to be fair, yachts, we only paid £2,000 for the Lucette because prices were much lower. And one day, a, a letter came through from a broker in Malta. So my dad and my sister caught a plane to Malta. I don't know why they did this, right? And they, they looked at the boat and bought it. There and then? There and then. But the wind, in that winter, the wind was blowing from the south for um, about two months. And, of course, you can't... Falmouth is, land, is, is locked, mm. locked out from the sea for sailing boats when the wind's coming from the south. So waiting, waiting, waiting. Wait, will this wind never change? And then it, Christmas came and went, and then uh, the wind suddenly shifted at the, towards the end, 20th, 21st of January this, the, the, of seventy one. The, the, the wind suddenly shifted to the north, coming out of the north, but it was gale force. Mm -hmm. But Dougal was not to be put, uh, put off, and he said, this is our chance, if we, so it's now or never, we, okay. we, because we can't afford to keep staying here, chewing up money, you know, um, we've got to go. So and what was the kind of, from him going, it's time to go, to you leaving, what was the time period? In that day. That no. same day. So at that point, was there a sense of trepidation that you were like, oh, wow, we were, we're actually We were it? babes to the tigers, you know. We had no idea what we were... But were you letting. excited or were you nervous? No, no I was scared. So, oh, okay, was scared. so... Now, okay. now suddenly, oh, yeah, great, yeah, you suddenly sail down real. the bay, don't you? Nice flat water, turn around the headland, bang, <laughs> big wave hits you. <laughs> and then suddenly you realise, hang on, it's not like this there. Yeah. Yeah, well, this is what it's like now, and it's going to get worse because this is going to go up to a full gale. And Dougal said, to, this is my training. Mm -hmm. This was the sum of my training. Douglas, come here. You have to attend Dougal. We called him Captain Bly behind his back okay. because he was a very tough character. And uh, he said, you see that line on the compass? That's called the lumber line. I mean, he had four months to tell me that. Why he had to tell me that now, I don't know. He says, you keep that lubber line next to that number, okay? Yes, Dad. Okay. And I took the wheel of the Lucette for the first time and I held it tight like this. I thought, if you hold it tight, the boat will go in that direction. Mm. It's a bit like, you know, if you're steering in a car, sure. you just hold the wheel straight and you, you'll go in a straight line. Of course, we know that's not true. And of course, so I'm holding onto the wheel and the first thing it does is jibe. That means the wind comes behind, knocks the mainsail across to the other side, like a, like a bullet, like a rifle crack. And the boat's a, and, and and he says, what are you doing? I don't know what I'm doing, Dougal, actually. I've got no idea what I'm doing, you know? And 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 so that was, we learn. We learn how to sail, you know, and I, I learned, to, that's, that was how I learned how to sail the, the, the Lucette, how to sail a boat. Anyway, uh, that night, my mum said, Dougal, can we send up the rockets? This is that, we'd had enough, you know. Oh, the what, as in, as in broken, flares? The flares, can we send up the flares? And Dougal in one of his famous uh, faux pas statements, said, don't be silly, Linda. Only a fool would be out in weather like this. <laughs> and my mum said to him, exactly. <laughs> that, that, was, that was what we were doing. You know, we were out in this heavy weather and we were completely untrained and uh, we were having a nightmare. So we, we, we sailed down through the Bay of Biscay yep. in very, very heavy weather. Mm -hmm. And um, we learned... We learned. I'll tell you what. I'll t 
that a wave, I was on watch, everybody was seasick. The bilge pump didn't work properly. We had to bail the, 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 the what had happened is a, a, a box of nails had fallen into the bilges oh, no. and punctured the bilge pump, the, the bellows on the bilge pump. So we had to bail the boat out by buckets. What does the bilge pump do? Sorry. It keeps the bottom dry. Right. Wooden boats work in a seaway and they let water in. It's designed like that. Yeah. And that swells the wood up and compresses the corking and makes it watertight. But the working of the boat lets water squeak, uh, uh, get, gets water in. So we had to bail it out by hand. There was, um, uh, it, it was mayhem down below. It was mayhem. <laughs> the, 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 the boat was rolling so heavily. And we were un, unaccustomed to it, all of us. We were not used to that sort of thing. And we were in very heavy weather. And I remember a wave coming over the stern hit me straight in the back and knocked me forward onto the onto the hatch. And I lay there on the hatch and I thought, you know what? I could just let the next wave just take me over. I don't care anymore. I've had enough of this. We were so seasick. It was that bad? Yeah, it was really bad. And, and my mother shouted at me. She says, Douglas, get inside. <laughs> she said, get inside us. I'll get your father to give you a good hiding, she said. And I thought, so what? And nothing could be worse than this. Yeah. You know, you, you, and, uh, you, you know, and, and, and another, another sort of event was my, we had this chicken supreme. We couldn't eat anything, but we had this chicken supreme and my mum made some and she tied herself to the galley to, to, to make it. And somebody had said to us about, Instead of having dishes, which were difficult to hold, mm. if you had like, baby's potties, oh, like okay. uh, you, you could hold on to that, like, and it was deep, they were deep, and you could put your food in there and it wouldn't get blown, because the wind blows your food out of the dishes. You know? <laughs> okay. Now, if you walk on deck with a cup of coffee, it'll blow all the coffee out of the cup, so right. you, you, you have to have, have deep you know, uh, uh, containers. So my mum had cooked this chicken supreme, which looks pretty awful, you know, and you've got to bear in mind everybody's being seasick. And then she walks aft and hands it to Dougal to eat. And Dougal takes the potty off and looks at it, throws it over <laughs> the side and passes it back to her, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, he didn't think it was food, you know. And, and uh, they, they laughed. That was the first time we'd laughed for uh, about 10 days. Right. You know, it, we'd had a, a, a baptism of fire. And we decided when we got to Lisbon, mm. that was it. We're selling. We're going to sail the boat back home, sell it, and that was the end. Your dad had agreed. We'd had enough. We'd had enough. Yeah, yeah. and your dad was on board. I, with that. No, I don't think so. I don't okay, think, I don't think we consulted him. Right. I think this was going to be a mutiny. Right. Right. So, um, <laughs> and uh, but the sun came out, and suddenly we were in a Portugal, and this is what this was all about, wasn't it? You know, and then the Canary Islands lay to the south. And promises of fine weather. Mm. And we thought, the mutineers group thought, well, we'll just go to the Canary Islands and see if it's any better. Mm -hmm. But if it's, no, if it's the same, then we're definitely coming back. Of course, we were lured into it, weren't we? There was no way we were going to come back from uh, a trip. The trip from Lisbon to the Canary Islands was beautiful blue seas, fine sailing weather, uh, you know, dolphins swordfish playing in the water around us. There was no going back. So it was in that leg that we finally decided that we were going to sail around the world. Mm. And uh, they, they were, we, we didn't have any money, though, so we would have to uh, work. We knew that. So um, you'd stop in places and work? We decided we'd stop in places and work. Okay. And where we could, where we could. So obviously not in the out islands, but in the industrial cities we could get work. So that was another decision we made. You can't do that today. Mm. But in the, back in those days, even though they had work visas and tourist visas, no, they didn't have a way of checking up. Mm. So we, we, we were able to work sort of below the... Uh, what kind of jobs? Well, I, I used to do gardening and uh, I used to do yacht deliveries. Mm. A very strong, fit sailor. By the time we got to Miami, I, was, I knew the business inside out, okay. you know. And um, in fact, I sailed for Baxter Still. He was a world famous yachtsman, delivering yachts for him. 
and then I got a job as a deck boy on a sailing ship and, you know, things like that. But I, my first job was gardening. Mm. And because I was a farmer, I was, you know, I could do gardening, weeding very easily, painting, that sort of stuff. And uh, in the black economy, you join the black economy mm. of different places we went to. I believe that your sister ended up get, staying well, somewhere along the way, didn't yeah. she? We, we sailed. We sailed with the Bonnie and, 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 and hooked up in different um, uh, ports of call. Yeah. Fantastic. I mean, something you can dream about. We're all the we're Canary Islands, across the Atlantic, all up through the Caribbean, the Leeward Islands and the Windward Islands, ended up in, uh, in uh, the Bahamas. And it's going great. And it's going great. And this is this is more like the tropical sort of paradise that we expected, mm. rather than those rough seas in the Bay of Biscay, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you know, uh, and we'd um, we'd sailed across the Atlantic. Thirty three days it took us across the Atlantic because wow. the the trade winds were off season, and uh, that that is exactly the same amount of time it took Christopher Columbus to sail across the Atlantic three hundred years before us. You know what I mean? <laughs> so we were sort of we we hadn't sort of progressed very far, you know, <laughs> but we had a great time, and. The other significant event through the um, Caribbean was that a, a fisherman was um, cast adrift with his engines had broken down in the Bahamas. Only Dougal would do this. We were a sailing boat and we'd rescued him. Mm. And we took him in tow and towed him under sail. We did were under sail. We towed this fishing boat into Nassau in the Bahamas and we made it in the papers. You know, it's our 15 minutes of fame. Mm. You know, this uh, English family had saved this fisherman and rescued, towed his boat under sail into Nassau. And and why is that towing under sail? Why is that? Well, it's just unheard of. Right. You tow with a tug, don't you, with an right. engine. Yeah. You know, you don't tow something with a sailing yacht. Sure. You know, because sailing yachts have to sail to the wind, you know. and, and But he, Fred just followed us. I mean, he was attached by a rope. It was a good deed my dad had done. Mm. And the local Rotary Club in Nassau uh, wanted us to, um, they, they wanted to reward us for helping one of their citizens mm. out. And one of the Rotarians had a dive shop and he, uh, he said, Look, you guys, you just come take anything you want. You know, wow. You can just have anything you want out of, out of here because, you know, you should. And we went on dive trips with them. But this chap had a son. And this son and my sister fell in love with each other. That's happens. And Anne suddenly announced that she was no longer going to come on the trip. She was leaving. How, that sounds fast. Oh. How long did that take for them to fall in love? Oh, it's pretty instantaneous. <laughs> I mean, you know, talk you about planning. Good-looking guy? Or? Good looking guy from a wealthy family. Yeah. But he was already promised. Oh. He came from a super wealthy family. And uh, they, they, uh, the, the parents were not uh, very pleased that he'd fallen in love with a... He was promised to the heir of the Revlon family. Okay. And uh, he was not to fraternise with, uh, you know, low-life yachts people. But Jeff... Stood up to his mother and said, no, we're going to get married. And suddenly, what? <laughs> it went from, visit, you know, towing Fred in to this, uh, uh, into the uh, harbour at Nassau and Anne saying that, that she was going to get married. How old was she? How old was Anne at this 18. Point? Okay, and, and Jeff my, was how old? A21. Wow. Yeah. And my mother was furious, of course, and Dougal was furious and it was just... That, and, but they were insisted on it and it was a sad day when Anne left us. And she stayed? And she stayed in Nassau, yeah. So you set off again, but so we, without Anne? Unbelievably, got, bear in mind, no telephones. <laughs> the only means of communication was airmail letters, mm. right? And Dougal and Linda decided that was okay and they were going to leave their daughter in Nassau. So we went to Miami for six months. We all got work, made money, and then there were only five of us. And how, how long had you been going now in total after, after Miami? That Miami? must have been, we were six months in Miami. Yeah. So working. Yeah. And, uh, so the, in total. So we, we must have been a year then. Let, let, I can actually work it out. If you count the sailing date as January 71, 
it was now January 72. Right, okay. So we, after Christmas, just after Christmas. Okay. And again, Dougal did his famous, we're leaving today. Okay. But you know what? We could have all settled in Miami. We, we loved America. We, 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 you know, I mean, it was, it was burgeoning out. There was no skyscrapers in Miami. Right. Then. But, I mean, now it's covered in skyscrapers. The economy was booming. It was like sort of... Uh, it was just starting. Finally yeah. free from the depression of war, you know, and the, sure. the war and, you know, Kennedy getting shot and they'd landed somebody on the moon and everybody was very upbeat in America. We sailed for another six months. We went to fantastic places. Uh, and we sailed south through Jamaica. Great place Jamaica was. And that was very rough, very dangerous, but a great place. On down through um, to the San Blas Islands, which were fantastic. Matriarchal society of a lost, like a lost civilization. Uh, through the Panama Canal. And uh, out in the Pacific Ocean. And we went then on to the Galapagos Islands. And we cruised the Galapagos Islands for three weeks. And um, we, we had met, we, we, we took a passenger from Jamaica to San Blas, because San Blas is very difficult to get to. Okay. He paid. Scott, okay. his name was Scott Tritt. He helped finance the voyage again. And then we met Robin Williams. But Robin, who's part of this story. Not okay. So, just for anyone listening, not aware yeah. of it, not the Robin Williams. Yes, but, the the Robin Williams. Well, yes, from this story. But oh, not yes, the actor. yes, from, yes, yes. No, no, not him. No, no. This was our Robin Williams. Yes, yeah. yeah okay. Uh, uh, and who was Robin Williams? He was a pass uh, passenger uh, who was hitchhiking around the world. Hitchhiking. Hitchhiking. I mean, I, they did in those days. So hitchhiked on boats. I hitchhiked on boats. Yeah. And uh, he was asked, he British? British. Yeah. Public school. Okay. Well spoken. My dad thought, at last I can fulfil my promise to educate the children while they're <laughs> at sea, because this guy was brimming with facts and figures. And, okay. You know. How old was he? He was 23. Oh, young guy. So, yeah, so, young, but, yeah. but older, older than me. By, yes. By a couple yeah. of years, you know, yes. uh, three, three, maybe four years, but three or four years. And um, they, uh, uh, so he joined the ship in, joined the yacht in uh, Colón, Panama, sailed through the canal, uh, to Panama City, and from Panama City out to Galapagos Islands. Mm. It took us 10 days to uh, to sail that trip. And although we didn't realise it then, a significant event took place, and that was a very large whale, 50-foot whale, uh, tried to make love to the boat, rolled over and rubbed its belly up against the boat. Okay. And, um, you know, that... that, that um, plume of water that comes out yes you know it stinks like you would not believe it's like putrid concentrated brussels sprouts and it just bathed the whole boat in this foul smell <laughs> that clung for a couple of days okay. obviously that whale thought we were another whale yeah and um had made a mistake and um it didn't occur to any of us at that moment that maybe we looked like a whale from underneath the water and had been a sort of case of mistaken identity. The whale realised that there was nothing go cooking and swam off and left us. And um, we, we get, got to the Galapagos Islands about a week after that. And as I say, we cruised the Galapagos Islands, fantastic, fantastic place, no water, no water on the Galapagos Islands. And um, so we, we'd had to take on extra water to um, make it all the way across to the Marquesas, which is where we were going. So it's a 2,700-mile trip. And, um, you know, we were going to be at sea for... After, once we left Galapagos, we were going to ha be at sea for uh, uh, 45 days, maybe. Mm -hmm. That sort of time. We'd geared ourselves up for that sort of time span. We did carry buckets of survival equipment ready for, should we need them, but on this occasion, because the water situation in Galapagos, we had uh, emptied them mm. and filled those buckets with water. Mm. And uh, that was a, a very unfortunate thing to have done. Um, so we, were, we, we, we finished our trip by walking up the volcano in Mount Fernandino. And I, we, we, one last trip to... Uh, um, Isabella Island, and I wrote the yacht's name on the cliff 
in paint, painted it along with some very famous names written on there. And um, we then set sail. Robin was having still learning how to sail, and uh, he was not a sailor. And um, we were two days. We'd sail two hundred miles in two days. It was rough. It was quite rough. We were in a reach, so we reefed. We'd reef the sails down, and um, everything was going okay. Mm -hmm. And um, then on um, June the fifteenth was the date. It was ten o'clock in the morning. Is seventy two still? Seventy two. Yeah, yeah. And um, I'd I'd been on the late the midnight watch, and um, I'd come up on deck at about must be quarter to ten, and um, my brother Sandy was on on the wheel steering the boat, and uh, we both saw something over on the starboard bow. Now, when you're a mariner of, of years' experience, as we were by then, uh, seasoned, I mean, far from the Falmouth days, we were seasoned sailors who knew a lot about sailing yachts and how heavy weather and f f could be calmed and sails, stitching sails and uh, rigging. And, you know, we, we'd lived on this you boat for, it, yeah. for, for two years now, mm. nearly almost. And But we saw this dark black thing, pat, uh, uh, shape in the seaway. And we knew it wasn't a bird because birds have got a softer profile. It was like a hard profile. And I now know that it was the fin of a killer whale. Mm. But we were still not perturbed by that. And um, the, um, uh, the fishing line was dancing. And uh, I pulled it in and there was a squid on the end of it. And I, I remember saying to Sandy, where the squid, there's usually bigger fish mm. because they eat squid. Mm -hmm. A lot of sperm whales and things like that eat, eat I just said, bigger fish. And the next second, um, bang, 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 like, a, like a, a bullet, like a shot from a howitzer, like a big gun. The, the crack was so loud that it hurt our ears. And I believe that was probably the keel breaking, snapping in half. And the boat was jarred in the in the seaway, and lifted bodily up from from the water, so that it sort of jolted us off our feet. And you know, nobody knew what that what had happened. Mm. And I remember popping my head down the hatch to look at my dad, and um, he was up to his ankles in water. Oh no. And, and I said, Dougal, what are you doing? Because I hadn't put two and two together yet. Uh, and then there was a loud splashing surfing noise behind us, and I turned my head, and there were three killer whales following us. I'd like, if you like, a daddy, a baby, and a mummy, if mm. you like, a sort of big daddy at this mm. side, closest to us. His head was split open, and water, blood was pouring into the sea. And I remember thinking... Whales don't, uh, animals don't hurt themselves on purpose. You know, they, they must have attacked us. Mm. And, uh, you know, my mind went back to that whale that had tried to make love to the boat. Mm -hmm. And now it looks like we'd been mistaken for a whale again. And, uh, but, but this time with dire consequences. I po poked my head back down the hatch and said, D whales, Dad, and, but he was up to his waist in water now. Oh, wow. So, and he said, abandon ship. Now, of course, I was 18 and knew everything. And Dougal was 47 and knew nothing, you see. So I said to him, Dougal, where do you think we're going to abandon ship to? I said, this is not Miami Marina. And Dougal said, over there, l get the life raft launched. And I thought, he's bloody serious, mm. you know? I thought, no, no, I must be dreaming. This is not happening. I know, I'll go forward, take the sails down, furl them onto the booms neatly and tidily. And by the time I wake up, this will have all be over. And I went forward and started to take the number one jib down. But 
the, 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 the boat was visibly settling in the seaway, you know, and, and Dougal suddenly appeared and said, get the life raft over the side. And I thought, this is for real. It was just at that moment that I realised this was for real, this was really happening, and we were going to be eaten alive by these killer whales. And I was sure that that was to be my fate. Mm. And uh, I, I, I picked the dinghy up, put it over the side, tied it onto the starboard rail, and I put the, put the oars in, and uh, I got the life raft over. I threw the life raft into the, into the ocean, pulled in the rope, hand over hand, hand over hand, and, you know, you, you get to the end of the rope and you give it a sharp tug like that. And I thought, this is never going to work, you know, like that. And to our relief and our great relief, the life raft started to inflate and unfold like that. And we thought, my God, thank God for that. And the next moment I was washed off the deck. A wave hit me in the legs, washed me off the deck, and I was in the water. And I was thinking the whales are still around. And I, I'd heard some, somewhere that you don't feel mm. the bite. You don't feel it. So I kept feeling to see if my legs were still there. And um, they, they, we could hear the whales, but we couldn't see them at this time. And the raft was now blowing away from the, because the wind was quite strong, from the wreck. The, the, the Lucette was wallowing in the, in the sea and stationary, but the, the raft was uh, blowing away. And Dougal, now this is like a sequence of events that sound like a disaster on their own, but when taken together probably saved our lives. Okay. Robin, the, the student from Panama, had stepped, you know, when you get in a dinghy, you step into the centre of the dinghy, mm -hmm. not into, onto the gunnel, on the edge. Of course, he, he stepped on the edge and uh, dipped the gunnel under the water and it flooded with water and filled, it was filled with water. So we couldn't use it anyway. Oh, no. And Dougal tied that to the raft. But that acted as a sea anchor to the raft and kept the raft close to the wreck site so we could all swim to the dinghy, to, to the raft, sorry. And so therefore, it saved us in a way. You know, that seemingly disaster saved us, stopped the raft from blowing away in the wind because it would just have blown away in yeah. seconds. And uh, it makes you wonder about design fault. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like sort of, you know, it's not, they're not as smart as you think. Maybe they're okay for big ships that can, you can get off in an ordered manner. Mm -hmm. But it would not have worked here but for that. Anyway, the raft was leaking and I was trying to stop the leak and I kept on trying to I put my finger in the hole and things like that. But I didn't realise that um, in actual fact the raft is made for inflating in the Arctic and the Antarctic and um, it's got enough CO2 in it. So it's got an excess of CO2 in the tropics mm -hmm. because it's hotter. You. And uh, the, 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 it was just bleeding off the excess CO2. So I was the last one to get into the raft and the others were already there. And we counted each other. We counted again that we were all there. Uh, my mum and dad thought I had gone. They thought they'd lost me. So did your mother and father, Robin Williams, the hitchhiker, yourself and the two twins, yeah. all on the raft? Sitting in the raft, looking very yellow because it's got a canopy over it. It's, yeah. it's made of yellow material. And, and my mum says, um, let's say the Lord's Prayer. Mm. And my dad said, I don't believe in God and I'm not going to say the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> and I said to Dougal, I said, Dad, you know, we might need God very soon. Why don't you just say the Lord's Prayer? You don't have to mean it. And he said, Douglas, if there was a God, don't you think he would know I didn't mean it? And it wouldn't count anyway? And I just remember that moment because I thought, what a hard man. You know, his life's on the line here and he still won't give in. Yeah, two minutes had gone past. That's all. But it seemed like a lifetime. And we looked at each other 
and we looked out to sea and the whales had gone and we looked for a ship that was never going to be found. I mean, the, 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 we were in a very, very desolate part of the ocean. And my dad, who'd always been our leader, we asked him if um, we were going to die. And Dougal looked at his family and he thought, they don't deserve to be lied to at this time. Mm. They deserve the truth. And somehow I've got to tell them that we're all going to die. There's no hope. We didn't get an SOS out. Uh, we had no food or water. I had managed to save two vital things whilst I was out fixing the raft. And that was the Genoa sail and my mother's sewing basket. What's a Genoa sail? It's a sail from the Lucette that yeah. was had been lying on the deck and it just washed over the side and it was part of the flotsam, if you like, mm. in the water. And I'd managed to get that and get get my mum's sewing basket. My mum's sewing basket was full of trinkets and things that were invaluable to us, like a pair of scissors, a bit of copper wire, a bit of string. These are invaluable to castaways. You know, although in a sewing basket, you look at, you wouldn't even notice they were there, you know. And um, Dougal was preparing us to tell us that this this was a very serious thing that had happened to us and that we were probably not going to make it. And he started to um, sum up what had happened. He says, we were 200 miles west of Cape Espinosa. We were hit by killer whales. The Lucette was sunk in less than two minutes, or two minutes or so. It's day, it was daylight, thank God, so we could all get off the boat, you know. He says, and we've made it to the raft. And we've got, we've got some water. There was 10 cans of water, maybe more, maybe 18 cans of water, so, uh, several cans of water. There's some rations, enough for 10 days. That's where the 10 comes from. It's enough for 10 days. But we're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. We're, we're downwind and down current from the Galapagos Islands. We'd have to sail a hundred miles a day just to stand still if we were going to sail back to the Galapagos Islands. So we can't go back to the Galapagos. Of course, me, 18 and a half years old, who knows everything, said to Dougal, Dad, it's clear to me there's only one solution. We know that it rains heavily in the doldrums. And one of the things... I came up with my famous saying, which is, you can live for 30 days without food and three days without water and 30 seconds without air. I don't know why I added that on, but it just seemed to rhyme. It's water that we need. Without water, we're going to die. And it rains in the doldrums. Why don't we sail to the doldrums? You know, we've got the raft, we've got the dinghy. That, that'll keep us afloat. As long as we can get water we should be able to make it 30 days. Mm. We should be able to get to land in 30 days. Can you explain what the doldrums are to anyone? The, the, the trade winds blow uh, all year round, mm. at varying strengths seasonally. And they're the winds that they go right round the world and they're each side of the equator. So the trade winds blow into the equator from the south and from the north. But of course the earth spins, so... If you can imagine the the air is trying to fill that uh, uh, collide here, and the earth turning, it, that it turns the wind that way. Mm. So you get the let me get it right: the southwesterly trade winds in the south, and the northeasterly trade winds in the north of the mm -hmm. equator. And of course, the the doldrums is like the ge meteorological equator; it just moves up and down as the trade winds move. And so the two airs meet and go up, and they, it creates v huge thunderstorms. Massive, like you'd never believe. The, the, the clouds go right up to the stratosphere and it rains heavily. So we should go there, collect rain, collect water. And then Dougal suddenly found that whilst he was sort of explaining to us why we were going to die, the conversation sort of switched to how we might survive. Okay. 
a sort of assessment of what we had, not what we didn't have. When we got enough water, strike out. We had the oars, strike out for the American coast. Wow. So suddenly we had a plan. And without a plan, you can't survive. Mm. You have to have a plan. And uh, so Dougal found himself explaining to us how we might survive rather than how we might die. And he said this was a turning moment for him. He realised that, uh, and, and we looked up, you know, the flying fish. They have flying fish out in the tropics. That's fish with very little big fins mm -hmm. that uh, help them fly. So when a predator comes, they jump out of the sea and they fly for about 100 foot. And then they, they, they've got away, basically. But... The frigate birds fly in the sky above, mm -hmm. and when they see one of these uh, flying fish jump out of the sea, they swoop down and just swoop it up and eat it, snap it out of the air. And this happened in front of us. Me and Dougal were discussing this plan, and uh, a frigate bird came down and just snapped up this flying fish as if mocking us. You know, like, look what I can do. You know, you useless human beings, you've got no chance. And I said to my dad, I said, they've got millions of years on us. <laughs> and Dougal said, yes, D Douglas, but we have brains. And with brains, we can make tools. And with tools, we can survive. Well, survive's hard work. Survival is hard work, very hard work. First of all, we had the raft and the dinghy together. We tied them together with the wire from that Genoa sail that I'd saved. Right, we um, we made uh, we were visited during the night by flying fish jump into the boat. We uh, a dorado, a big dolphin, sport sport fish, jumped into the dinghy one night. Wow! And we got that and killed it and ate that. You know, raw, just ate it. Oh raw. yeah, yeah. So what you, do you you didn't have knives? So how no, were you? No, no, just tore it. To, wow! Yeah, I tell you what, human man, he, mankind. Just under the surface of civilization <laughs> is thousands of years of skills mm -hmm. that we've forgotten. You don't need them living in London, do you? But you don't know you've got them till you end up in a situation like that. Mm. And suddenly, you know what? We caught turtles. I caught the very first turtle. It came along. I had a, 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 a piece of an oar and I hit it on top of the head. And his eyes filled up with blood. And he swam away. And I remember saying to my dad, I said, Dad, you know, we've got to hunt, mm. not catch. These, these animals don't want to give their lives away. Mm. They'll fight to the very end. We have got to catch th and hunt them and kill them if we're going to eat them. And we agreed that we had to be a lot smarter the next one came along and I thought, well, I'll, I'll lift it out of the water. It won't be able to swim away then. So I lifted it straight out of the water and then I didn't realise they got razor sharp, um, those flippers they've mm. got on the rear of them, they are bone and razor sharp. Wow. And now suddenly it's chopping my hands like this, you know, and, like, oh. and I threw it into the raft which was the last place I should have thrown it because now it's flapping around inside oh, the inflatable wow. raft and Dougal's going uh, like this and they're all jumped up on the thwart, you know, and, and Dougal picks this turtle up and throws it out through the front <laughs> and so the turtle's gone and we're back to square one again, you know. We weren't being very smart about this, you know. The third turtle came along and there was a, 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 a like a safety line with a coit on the end of it for throwing out to people who were in the vicinity of the yep. raft so you could pull them in. And I tied it up in that. And then, so it couldn't move its flippers and it couldn't get away. And Dougal went round to the dinghy, which was towing us, and I passed him the, the, the end of the rope and he pulled the turtle round and we pulled the turtle on board. And we had a knife, a kitchen knife. I don't know how it had found its way into the bottom of the dinghy, but it was there. And Dougal cut the throat of the turtle and bright red blood spurted out. And I'd read a fiction story by Alistair MacLean called South by Java Head where these people had survived on a lifeboat and they drank turtle blood. Mm. And I said, Dad, I think you can drink turtle blood. I, I mean, it was a, it's a novel, right? So, mm. I said, well, give it a try. 
<laughs> and he 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 drank some turtle blood and realized that it was not salty and that you could drink that and perhaps live off it so we 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 sort of thought that's a a, a source of food mm. very protein rich and um the turtles had red meat like steak so we thought we can dry this meat and store it and and um so turtles became our mainstay. And were they just around in abundance? We realised later that mating, it was a mating instinct ah. that brought them to us. So what happens, they must meet up in the deep sea and mate. And then, in fact, we sort of witnessed this and then they, that's it, they're gone. So if we had two turtles in the vicinity, say a male and us, and then a female came along, they would couple and go. right. So we, we, we realised we had to catch the males and the females. But the very first one we caught was a female. And in it was eggs, egg yolks, hundreds of them, like grapes, like bunches of grapes. How did you know which bits you could eat? Or were you so you, hungry? I tell you, you've got instinct. Right. You've got instinct. We knew that the liver of the turtle was poisonous. How did you, you read oh, that? Uh, never read it. Okay. You just looked at it. You knew you couldn't eat it. Right. Whereas the liver of the shark, you could eat it. And you get home and you find out the, ter liver, the, the, the liver of the turtle is poisonous and the liver of the shark is healthy. You know, but you, you've got this innate ability and, uh, you know, you touch it in a situation like this. And I've read other great survival stories where the people have had the same experience. A realisation comes to them what you can and can't do. I suppose it's a bit like being in a, in a forest and seeing red berries and you get this sense that yes. the red berries are yeah. dangerous somewhere inside. Soft, you. soft red berries. Mm. No, don't eat that. Mm. You know, you've got, there's an, uh, an alarm ringing, mm. you know. And we, we had a few lemons and we had a few... We had lemons? Water. Yeah, uh, my mum had put a bag of lemons oh, I see. and a bag of onions, would you believe, into the... Uh, a dinghy at the moment of the shipwreck but how so the way you're describing it is amazing and it sounds like a kind of like adventure but was there still a sense of impending doom yeah absolutely yeah absolutely and the, and the younger kids the twins i think they were immune to that too young i think they were too young and they right. thought well i don't know why we're doing this but if my mum and dad are doing it then we'd better be and, doing and it. they were 12 or 13 yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. They, 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 maybe sandy thought a little bit that it was perhaps a little bit unusual to be yeah. doing this sort of thing, you know. But nobody was screaming, we're going to die, we're going to... No. Die. No, it was all, let's just do we, the... We made a deal. We made a deal to each other in those early, that first day, that no matter what happened, we wouldn't eat each other and that we would die together. Wow, you said that out loud? Yeah. Because what what's it called? We the need, custom it, of the sea, is that Oh, it? yeah, the custom of the sea. Can you tell us about that? Well, I mean, the, the Custom of the Sea is outlawed now. Yes. But there, there is a book called The Custom of the Sea, a very good read, about the very last case of cannibalism mm. at sea, where it was accepted up until that ruling, which was about 1870, something like that, or maybe 1800s, mid-1800s, where you drew straws to see who would be eaten. The one that drew the short straw was the person that would be eaten. And it was accepted as the custom of the sea. So that the others could live. So the others could live. And um, they, um, uh, they, 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 in big ships, the, the crew were even in groups. F passengers first, female passengers before male passengers. Then seamen, sailors, then ship's officers, apprentices, cadets first, chief officer last, Captain took no part in it. That was the custom of the sea. My God. And, you know, we thought about the custom of the sea and we decided, because Robin, of course, was not a family member, and we assured him that we would die together. Um, Do you think he was... We're in this together. Yeah, I think he was very... He thought you might eat him. He thought we might eat him. And he was very uh, gratified to hear us say that. We said, no, you are one of us. You're one of our family, and we will treat you like that. And we will die together if that's what is going to happen. You know, so we'd made that promise to each other as well. And, you know, these are bizarre conversations, aren't they? You know, mm. but when, when, when things like that happen, 
you have to discuss those things so you know where you stand. Dougal was going to tell us we were all going to die, but he ended up telling us we were all going to live. Mm. We were discussing how we were going to live. Robin thought we were going to eat him secretly, and we assured him that we were not going to do that. And we were sincere. We were sincere that if this is it, this is it. And, uh, and what was the temperature like? Hot. Very hot. It's tropics, so thirty-seven degrees. That's wow. it all, all the time. But at night time, it was, it was. But it was still warm. But it was cooler. But in those thunderstorms in the doldrums, it was bloody freezing. Right. And we were shivering like we were. So shivering. you made it to the doldrums. We made it to the doldrums. And how many days were you out here when you got there? Ten days. So ten days. And ten did it? Days did it feel like ten days, or did it feel like a year? It felt like a year. It felt like all our lives. That did. It was, it was, uh, uh, you know, I'm describing these things, but yeah. they were hard work, a yeah. lot of innovation, a lot of hard work. Yeah. The, the raft was leaking, so we were up to our chests in water. Oh, God, really? We, 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 uh, we couldn't sleep because of that. So we had a thwart, a central thwart, which was dry. And you, we could take an hour, turns, an hour on that thwart. Then you had to get back into the water again. So we wow. rotated around. So you just and sleep for an hour, come back into the water? You sleep for an hour and then get back in the water. And I always remember my mum, God bless her, saying to me one day, she said, Douglas, you can take my turn on the thwart. You know. And of course you take, that you're, you take it selflessly, don't you? You take it. And of course now I reflect on that because my mum stayed in the water mm. and was cold. Mm. You know, that water robs your body of heat. Mm. And uh, they, they, uh, we knew the raft was killing us. Staying in the raft was killing us. It, it developed leaks. And um, The children, I just keep thinking of the twins, those uh, young children. Like, Well, you, you know, you talk of the twins and you, you talk of survival. But uh, Dougal put it in his book, and I repeated it in my book, um, that uh, the twins kept us honest. We had a reason to survive. It was to save their lives. You know, my mum and dad were four, in their late 40s. They'd kind of had their lives, you could say. I'm, I'm not being facetious. I'm just saying they'd mm. lived a life. I was a young man. I'd just become a man. I didn't want to lose my life. And uh, Robin, too. You know, he was a bit older than me. He, he was on a trip around the world. He didn't want to lose his life. And the twins hadn't even started their lives. But my, my dad said, I'll get these boys on a steamer home if it's the last thing I ever do. He'd made us that promise way back on that first day. And, uh, you know, that gave us a reason to keep going. And maybe without that reason to keep going, I'll tell you what, it would have been so easy to just lie down and die mm. because it was so difficult to survive. Bailing, blowing up by mouth, that raft blowing it up by mouth. Eventually, on the 17th day, the raft sank and we had to all get into the dinghy itself. So we now, whilst it was dry in the dinghy, if that dinghy flooded, that was it. Mm. We, were, we were doomed. So the dinghy was the last, last the resort? The dinghy was the last, last resort. It's nine foot long. Oh, wow. It's three foot wide. But it goes down to a point at the, at the bow, at the front. Wow. So this, and three people lived in that space. And, you know... Uh, You've got to be right. this dinghy had three worlds, three entire worlds going on in this dinghy. The forward end where my dad and the twins were, uh, where they overlapped each other. The stern where me and Robin, uh, we, we could, you know, uh, we could lie with our feet up like that, mm. but we could lie down with our feet and our head on the uh, after thwart. And then the, the thwart, the central thwart, where the watchkeeper sat and we rotated they, 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 so the watchkeeper was always looking out, uh, hopefully for a rescue ship that was not to be found, mm. you know. So what but would you say was the lowest moment? The lowest, lowest moment was when we lost the water that we'd been so carefully preserving. And, you know, Robin was not a sailor, God bless him. And uh, it, he, he was not to blame for what happened. But we did entrust him to tie the water bowl the water bag out of the way while we kill this turtle mm. and he just didn't tie it properly properly securely i mean he wasn't to know that the turtle's flipper was to catch underneath the bag and it just 
flipped it out like this and suddenly all the water was in the bottom of the no. dinghy. And we all knew immediately what that meant. We had no water, you know? Turtles' but, revenge. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, they, they, we were, became very despondent. And I remember saying to my dad, look, you know, Dad, I can't go on. I, I've had enough, basically, and, and I'm ready to go. And my dad was a very hard man, very tough. And um, he, he said to me, Douglas, do, do not let your bright light go out. He said, we need you to survive so the rest of us can survive. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, Dad, you can't even let me die in peace. You know, we were deadly serious now because we were, we'd lost a lot of weight. We, you know, you see that? This can of water mm. here, that would last a week. Wow. That's how, and I'm describing it, but to give it some context, we caught turtles. We had a little square of meat three times a day. That was our food. We were very, very hungry, but you get used to hunger. You, after a couple of days, you, you don't feel it the same way as you do in the first two days. So, and the, so the water was just sips? Just sips. And it was voluntary sips. And not everybody took a sip when they should have taken a sip, especially my mum. And my dad was watching her, and he made her sip. You know, she said, the, the twins need it more than me. And Dougal said, no, without you, the twins will not survive. You have to drink water. You know, and... Um, there was a lot of self-sacrifice am amongst us. And maybe that wouldn't have been the case had we not been a family, mm. you know. And um, I'm, I'm just going to say for audio listeners that um, Douglas held up a can of water that was, it's a very small can, 300 milliliters, yeah. just for people who need a bit of context for yeah. how long that would have lasted. Yeah. yeah. And when we, were, when we lost the water, we went five days with no water. And that was when I said that to my dad about I'd had enough. And then, you know, it rained. In fact, it rained away from us. And we thought, this is just too much. You know, yeah. it's raining over there. If we were over there, we'd get that water. And then suddenly the heavens opened and it rained on us, you know. And we collected this water. And it's, you know, water is God-given. Without it, you can't live. And we filled our bag up. And we were, you know, we were back on for our trip. We, were, we, were, we, we would start rowing that night for the American coast. And uh, so that was the worst moment. But mm. the most terrifying moment mm. was in the doldrums when we got caught in a thunderstorm and lightning was hitting the water around us. No. And you could smell that acrid smell of electricity in the air. Just literally Yeah, yeah, yeah. it comes straight down. Not a, not a lightning like a zigzag line like a fork of lightning. These are straight bolts of lightning coming straight out of the base of the cloud into the sea. And I, I remember saying to my dad, this is hell. This is what hell is like. And he said, yes, it is. And I said, you know, we're going to get hit by lightning and we're going to all get fried to death. And every, nobody will actually know how we died, you know. The, the, and he said, it, it could happen. We agreed it could happen. But the lightning was also a friend because... I remember one night when we were trying to, uh, it was very bad weather, and we were trying to uh, keep the bow onto the waves to prevent the water from swamping the dinghy. And uh, I remember Dougal reaching the end of his tether, and uh, he was on the verge of giving up. He couldn't keep the boat mm. uh, bow on to these waves, and it was dark. And... Uh, a bolt of lightning, a sort of a glow of lightning shone through the base of the cloud. And my mum was looking at Dougal and Dougal was looking at my mum. And my mum was reminding him of that promise he'd made mm. that he would get us on a steamer home. And so Dougal had that same moment with my mum where, you know, the, the, the eyes can say a lot and where he was reminded of his obligation, really. Mm. And Dougal did acknowledge that obligation. He was not going to give up easily, but he, 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 
it, it was desperate. You know, the water was swamping the boat. We were, we, Robin was bailing, my mum was bailing, and I was scooping out with my hands like in a cup to get the water out because so much water, it was raining so heavily. And uh, the, the, we didn't like to curse the rain because we needed it to mm. live by. But we, uh, uh, but this was too much, you know, it was just too much. It was, we had no clothes on, all our clothes had vanished. Uh, they just... Uh, everything. Everything, we were, we were naked. Wow. And the rain was pouring on us and we were so cold. So when you say vanished, you mean just uh, eroded or... It, well, I'll tell you what had happened. We, we, we took them off, but they did erode as well. And they, they, we took them off because we, we were covered in boils from head to foot. Oh. From seawater boils. And something called immersion foot. If you get immersed in water for a long period of time, you, you the blood supply gets cut off from your hands and feet and you, you break out in seawater boils. And we found that by having no clothes on, because the clothes were harbouring the salt. Sure. And so if we if we took them off, that we actually the boils went away. But the 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 um, immersion foot was still there while we were in the raft, but not in the dinghy. So we were in much better shape in the dinghy, okay. but it was a much more dangerous yeah. place to be because if it sank, there was no way back, whereas the raft couldn't sink because it was inflatable. All you had to do was keep it inflated. and that But that was a job. You know, It was too much for us without, without a proper pump mm -hmm. to um, inflate the, the raft. But you work out methods, mm. and we worked out methods to determine which direction we were going and how far we'd gone. And, you know... After 38 days, we were picked up and we were only 25 miles out in our latitude and 100 miles out in our longitude. And we'd, we'd, dis we'd invented this um, uh, cafe that we would open when we got home. Mm. But this gave us an excuse to talk about food. And when you're hungry, believe you me, you can talk about a pork chop for an hour. <laughs> okay. You know? And how you're going to eat it when you get home, and what sauces you're going to put with I it. I mean, that sounds like adding and, to the torture. And you go, T -t tell me about that sauce again, <laughs> you know? And what, we, what kind of pork chop are we talking about here? Are we talking about a loin chop, or are we talking about a pork chop with a long, you know, the long rib bone? We, the detail that we went into because we were so hungry mm. and we could visualize this food in our heads. Was, it was non-stop. Anyway, we, we, we decided we'd open this cafe and we had a menu and we'd discuss things that might be on the menu. And we were discussing that very important subject this afternoon. It was cloudy. Uh, we'd replenished our water supply after, that, uh, after we'd uh, mm. lost it. And we were talking about how far off land we might be. We thought maybe we're only 10 days off land. Could that really be true? It turned out we were six days off land when we got picked up. And it was going to be that afternoon, but we didn't know it then. And uh, the, uh, um, we, were, we were discussing this uh, a wine license because, well, I mean, we discussed just about everything else. And this is kind of fantasy, isn't it? So... And Dougal looked up and he said, there's a ship over there. And then returned to the conversation about the wine line. <laughs> and I said to him, Dad, you said there's a ship. He says, yes, a ship. A ship, bloody hell, there's a ship. It's like almost we'd forgotten that we were looking for a ship because we were so focused on getting to land. And that was our whole sort of reason d'etre, so to speak. You know, we were... We were and... Suddenly, the, the urgency um, descended on us. Mm. We took the sail down, and Dougal stood on the thwart, something you must never do. But we, we balanced him, and uh, he fired. He held up one parachute flare. It struck, thank God, and uh, went, then it lasted him a minute or two and went out. We had one flare left, and Dougal took the second flare, and it, it just sort of... It was a bit difficult, but then it struck and it was a red, glowing red, and he held it up like this and it burnt and burnt and burnt. And then it was burning his hands. The, 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 the flux was dropping down and burning his hand, hands and he threw it away like that. And that, that arc was the bit the Japanese saw. Wow. 
they saw the ark, a red, a red ark. He described it, the helmsman described it as. And we knew that was our last flare. So if they didn't see that, this was going to sail right past us again. And she altered course. 10 degrees. Was it, was it just rolling in a seaway? Was she just adjusting her course? Then she altered course another 10 degrees. And then suddenly another 10 and she was pointing at us. And we realised that she was coming to pick us up. And Dougal said, you know, I think our ordeal is over. And, uh, you know, well, I, I remember the Japanese throwing a rope over to us, a dirty, oily rope. And I, I grabbed it and I looked at that rope and thought, this is, this is our link back to civilization. This, I would normally not hold such a rope, you know what I mean? I'd kick it out of the way. But here I clung on to it for dear life because I knew what it meant. And suddenly we were on the deck of, of the Tokamaru and we looked back and Dougal said, will you save the dinghy, please? And you know, the instinct... The, the, the desire to save the dinghy was to save the food in the dinghy because we were so focused on food and mm. water. We didn't want to throw our food away. And the captain said, we have food. We've got food on the ship. And we were going like sort of, yeah, you might not have food, you know. It's, uh, maybe you're lying to us, you know. But we've definitely got food on that dinghy. Anyway, they, they begrudgingly hauled it on board. Wow. Thank God because that dinghy is now in the National Maritime Museum in Falmouth, and you can go and look at it. And if you do go there and look at it, you will not believe how small it is, how six people could have fitted in that dinghy. It is astonishingly small. And there is a message on the, on the forward thwart, a message to my sister, who had left us in Nassau, explaining to her what had happened. So we were back on the deck of the Tokamaru and we were looking back out onto the sea. We were safe now. We were going to Panama City. But we missed that. And this is the irony of it. We were masters of our fate. We had survived 38 days on that raft, on the dinghy and the raft combination. We'd caught turtles, we'd caught Dorado, we'd caught a shark even. We had caught rainwater. So we were innovated. We innovated and we survived. And we looked back at the sea of the Pacific. And we missed it because our, our lives had value every day, verified every day, because we were still alive. That was a simple measure. Mm. And we never thought that we would survive another night as we contemplated the darkness. The sun went down. The night time was more dangerous than the daytime. And we wondered if we'd ever see the sun rise again. Douglas, it's an absolutely amazing story. And you tell it incredibly. Oh, thank you. And um, it's just yeah. fascinating. I can hear there's like a pin drop in this room. I can hear everyone's absolutely wrapped in it. But we, we've we unfortunately run out of time. Um, the thing that I do want to say to you is thank you so much for coming here and talking to us about it. It's an amazing story of hope and you know, the sort of indomitable will of pushing Absolutely. forward Absolutely. under adversity. Um, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you. And it's a pleasure to share it. There are times I've got f***ing hell, I've had chills on my back. And how the hell did that happen? How mm -hmm. did I just walk away from that? Somebody your distance from me trying to blow my head off and missed with six bullets. How the f*** did that happen? Has that happened? Yeah. God. And I'm like, how the f*** did that happen? <laughs> to this day, I still don't know. 